Hello and welcome to this lecture on viruses. Today we will be talking to you about viral genomes with reference to their molecular biology. This course code is IB6213 and is part of the MSc in Molecular Biology by Coursework. The objectives of this lecture are to introduce you to the structure and function of viral genomes, to introduce you to the application of viral genomic features in genetic engineering, to facilitate the design and development of diagnostic tools for the detection of viruses, and to inform you regarding the elements of biorisk associated with viruses. Let us take a look at your learning outcomes. Upon completion of this lecture module, you should demonstrate the ability to describe the relationship between the structure and function of viral genomic features. Design a DNA construct based on defined features and design a method for the diagnosis and detection of viruses based on a priori information. Let us look at viruses in general. A lot of news has been generated about the recent outbreaks of viruses specifically with reference to COVID. So what do we understand by viruses? The first thing about viruses is that they are ubiquitous and they are integral components of all the kingdoms of life. They have no integral cellular structure and derive their components from the organisms they infect, which implies that they cannot exist or propagate beyond the host. Viruses are highly host-specific, which can be explained by their uni unique genomic features such as the internal ribosome entry site, which can be exploited for applications in genetic engineering. Uh, now the internal ribosome entry site is a unique element of mRNA viruses or RNA viruses, which exploits the cellular machinery to elicit the process of protein translation. Some of you may wonder why we study viral genomes and why this research is very important in today's context. The first thing which we look at is the relationship between the structure and the function. Many viral elements such as the receptors are vital for understanding the, the methodology or the means by which viruses interact with cells. The next aspect which we look at is the discovery of novel viruses. Novel viruses present a challenge to humanity as well as to the industry which develops vaccines and their discovery is paramount to defending humanity against these viruses. The third aspect is genetic engineering. When we uh, use viral elements such as the promoter binding sites to engineer genes, we are essentially exploiting viral elements for the development of new genetic tools. Of course, the fourth aspect is diagnostics. We need to know about viruses in order to develop the pertinent diagnostic tools. And finally, we look at vaccines. In order to develop a vaccine, which may be either second generation or third generation, we need to look at the viral elements which are essential for eliciting an immune response in human hosts. Let us begin by looking at the structure and function of viral genomes. Okay. Now when we want to classify viruses, we look at the ICTV, which is the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses, which is the lead agency for the classification of viruses. So we have around 1,550 species which have been recognized and there are many viruses which have been undiscovered at this point in time. And as genome sequencing advances, new information about viruses is becoming available at the gene bank and other publications. Currently, viruses are divided into three orders and within these orders, specific families and specific, uh, species of viruses fall within these groups. The first classification is based on structure. So viruses are divided into three orders and we have groups 1 to 7 based on the Baltimore classification scheme. 
The classification based on genomes is fairly straightforward. Group 1 represents the double-stranded DNA viruses. Group 2 represents the single-stranded DNA viruses. Group 3 represents the double-stranded RNA viruses. Group 4 is the plus sense RNA viruses which consist of a positive stranded RNA molecule. Group 5 consists of the negative stranded RNA molecule containing viruses. Group 6 is the RNA reverse transcribing viruses and group 7 represents the DNA reverse transcribing viruses. A point to note is that when we look at viral genomes, they may not essentially comprise of a single monopartite entity. In the case of RNA viruses, the viral genomes may be bipartite or consisting of two or more uh, fragments of RNA. In addition to the viruses, we also have the prions and other subviral particles which are classified in a different group. These may consist of elements which are capable of causing disease or elements which can work alongside viruses to increase the virulence of that specific virus. The viral genome is enclosed in a capsid and there are three basic configurations by which we define a viral capsid. The first configuration is helical, the second is icosahedral and the third one is complex. This is an example of a helical capsid. This is a tobacco mosaic virus, so you can see the protein subunits which have been assembled around a coil RNA core. All these images are derived from the Creative Commons library, so please cite these images and attribute them if you use them. The second configuration is the icosahedral co configuration. This consists of a polyhedron with faces over here which can consist of 20 equilateral triangles and vertices. These are the vertices. The protein units are known as or designated as capsomeres and capsomeres consist of protomers. Pentamers are located at the vertices. So you have one, two, three, four, five pentamers and hexamers are located at the edges of this particular icosahedron. We also have complex, uh, uh, complex architecture in the case of phages. So phages comprise of a head, a collar and a tail. These are complex uh, viruses which infect bacteria. If you note uh, the differences between eukaryotic and bacterial viruses, you will see that bacterial viruses are far more complex. They have specific proteins which define the head, the collar, the tail, as well as fibers. This virus is a bacteriophage which will function by injecting its DNA into the bacterial host. Viruses can also be enveloped and the envelope will generally consist of a bilayer which, will, uh, which is derived from the host cell. Lipids and carbohydrates from the host cell are generally incorporated into the viral envelope. Let us look at the genome organization of RNA viruses to begin with. RNA viruses will consist of a positive strand or a negative strand. In case they have a positive strand, the RNA is translated directly by the host machinery. Negatively stranded RNA viruses have to be transcribed or translated by first converting them to the positive strand. Some RNA genomes may be segmented and they are divided into separate parts. In the case of uh, DNA viruses, we can have DNA double-stranded or single-stranded viruses. All genes from the DNA viruses are transcribed by the host RNA polymerase 2, except some viruses which are transcribed by the polymerase 2 gene. 
Genes which are transcribed by RNA polymerase II give rise to multiple mRNAs that are produced by alternative splicing and use of different polyadenylation sites. What we have to understand about viruses is that they utilize the host machinery very efficiently and because they are packaged into very small molecules, the, there are several innovations which viruses have developed. These include reverse transcription as well as utilization of the host transcription and translation machinery to translate, transcribe and assemble their genomes. In DNA viruses, we have the transcription of early genes as well as the transcription of late genes, both of which are involved in different phases of the viral replication cycle. In the case of reverse transcribing viruses, I have taken the example of the cauliflower mosaic virus, which is a plant virus. They are generally double-stranded viruses with a 8,000 base pair genome which encodes 6 to 7 proteins. The gene expression is initiated from the 35S RNA and the virus will produce a polycystronic mRNA. A polycystronic mRNA consists of a single strand of RNA in which different proteins are encoded and this is translated eventually and spliced based on the specific virus. So viral DNA, double-stranded DNA is released into the nucleus where it is transcribed by the host RNA polymerase II. 35S RNA and 19S RNA translation produces viral proteins and 35S RNA is retrotranscribed in the cytoplasm into new double-stranded DNA genomes. Uh, interesting point to note about cauliflower mosaic virus is that the genetic component or the nucleic acid is infectious by itself without the viral coat protein. Now this virus is transmitted by aphids and it has specific proteins which will bind to the aphid stylet and which are transmitted by aphids when they bite or infect different plants. Let us look at some of the genomic features and I will describe them. The first genomic feature is the internal ribosome entry site. This is an element of the RNA viruses which is located at the 5 prime end of plus SSRNA viruses or plus positive single stranded RNA viruses which will bind to the host ribosomal machinery and translate the messenger RNA. The second aspect or the second feature is the polyprotein. Polyproteins are proteins which are produced as a single unit before they are spliced or cleaved by the viral RNA or the viral uh, protein proteases. These proteases are encoded in the polyprotein itself, so the virus will essentially synthesize a large protein molecule which will then cleave itself into its integral components. Viruses utilize leaky scanning which means that they will cause a mismatch in the scanning of the RNA molecule. So you will get a multiple set of proteins from a single mRNA molecule. This contributes to their mutability. The second aspect which they have or the second feature is frame shifting. Frame shifting allows a single mRNA molecule to encode multiple proteins by having multiple start codon sites. Some viruses employ alternative splicing in which elements of the RNA are spliced alternatively to produce a combination of different proteins. And some viruses express proteins which interfere or silence the host RNA interference pathway which enables them to overwhelm hosts. Now let's as look at viruses in action. How do viruses 
actually function within the host. These are the following stages of virus replication. So the first step is attachment, the second step is penetration, the third step is uncoating, the fourth step is genome replication and gene expression. Then we have assembly, maturation of and release. Now please take note that this is a general process. There may be specific processes associated with different viruses. The first step is attachment. Now as you know, some viruses will infect you via the nasal route, some by the oral route, some by the ocular route. You will ask yourself, why does this virus or why is this virus so specific to a specific organ or cell type? It all comes down to the receptors. What has to be noted from an evolutionary standpoint is that viruses have taken advantage of molecules required by cells for normal cellular function. These comprise the receptors. Viruses bind to receptors. They may bind to a multiple receptors, a multiple set of receptors or they may bind to specific receptors. And this receptor binding facilitates attachment of the virus to the host cell or the host membrane. This has a ecological or evolutionary advantage as the viruses become very host specific and can propagate only in a specific host. It has an evolutionary disadvantage in the fact that it does not allow the virus to multiply or infect multiple hosts. So this process or this property is defined as tropism. The next stage is penetration. In penetration, the virus will translocate across the cell membrane and undergo a process known as endocytosis. It will fuse to cellular proteins or in the case of bacteriophages, it will inject the nucleic acid which is the DNA into the bacterial host. Endocytosis is mediated by a process known as clathrin mediated endocytosis. Clathrin and epsin both interact with each other in order to produce a molecule which can transpass the cellular boundary. Once the virus has entered into the host cell, the next process of uncoating is initiated. The capsid is completely or partially removed to expose the genome. Again, a note of caution, uncoating is different in different kinds of viruses. So these are some of the examples of different viruses and the process of uncoating. Some viruses may not uncoat their genome fully in order to basically shield themselves from the host viral uh, RNAi silencing pathway. Genome replication depends on the type of the genome and the group to which they belong. So all viruses, RNA, DNA, O, retrotranscribing, viruses have unique or specific processes associated with genome replication and gene expression. This is a short note on the modes of replication. So in the case of RNA viruses, the RNA genome may act as the mRNA to be directly translated into protein. These genomes are plus S sense RNA. The RNA genome may act as a template for mRNA synthesis by a viral enzyme which converts the negative stranded RNA genome into a plus stranded which is then translated by the host translational machinery. What we have to understand is that each virus may have its own unique method of replication based on the nucleic acid.
we now move on to assembly assembly of viruses is a very complex process as it involves assembly within a cellular environment you can imagine a cellular or host cell in which you have differing biological processes you have biochemical processes ongoing in the cell you have dna replication protein expression mrna translation and the viral molecule basically overwhelms all these processes and then assembles itself within the host cell now with viral molecules the process of self assembly is studied extensively it uh, basically allows the viruses to assemble their protein molecules or their capsid proteins purely on the basis of similarity how the process actually occurs is a matter of much debate and still being investigated in vitro and in vivo once assembled in the host cell the virus particle is now mature and it may involve some additional steps such as glycosylation or the post translational protein modification before it's basically ready for export the release is the final step so release can di uh, differ some vi viruses may be released by budding or exocytosis in which the cell is intact the host cell remains intact some viruses will lyse the cell and release themselves this again depends on the virus itself so in bacteriophages we have the lytic and the lysogenic phases so lytic fa uh, phages will not basically lyse the cell and lysogenic phas uh, phages will maintain the cell as it is we now move on to detection and diagnosis of viruses i will briefly discuss the mechanisms or some of the techniques associated with detection and diagnosis of viruses detection of viruses can be done in three ways one is by immunological detection using antibodies the second is nucleic acid detection using either the polymerase chain reaction or reverse transcription of rna viral genomes followed by the detection using real time polymerase chain reaction and the third is electron microscopy i have mentioned cox postulate because some viruses may need to be validated for their infectious cycle using cox postulate now when researchers work in the lab to determine if a virus is actually a causative agent of a particular state of morbidity or mortality they have to refer to what is known as cox postulate i'll give you an example for instance i want to test a virus for its infectious cycle i have to use an animal model as it is unethical to use anything beyond an animal model to test cox postulate i will take a animal which is basically a host for the virus so we begin with a healthy animal which is a known host for that particular virus we then infect this particular animal and ensure that the virus has infected the animal subsequent to this we observe the animal for any symptoms which are linked to that virus now in order to validate this cox postulate we need to go one step further is basically isolate the virus from the animal itself and infect it into an another healthy animal and if the animal does manifest the same signs of infection it's highly likely that that particular virus is the causative agent that is a brief on cox postulate you may need to read more about it in order to understand cox postulate 
Nucleic acid based methods are far simpler, however they involve multiple steps. The first step involves identification of the virus itself. Once we identify the virus, we can proceed to genome sequencing. Many viral genomes are now available at the NCBI gene bank. You can reference them in order to develop host specific primers for PCR. Once we have identified the genome, we, Id we use algorithms to find constant and variable regions. This is a similarity search. We then design locus specific primers for that particular virus. The next step which is 5 involves sample preparation. If you are working with a highly pathogenic virus, essentially you need to apply biosafety management protocols during sample preparation. This may involve inactivation of the viral nucleic acid which can be highly infectious. Subsequent to sample preparation, we go on to nucleic acid amplification. Again, this step depends on the type of virus. For instance, if the virus is a DNA virus, you may directly resort to PCR of DNA molecules. However, if it is a RNA virus, you may have to resort to reverse transcription prior to PCR. In any case, please do not amplify viral nucleic acids in a non-contained environment. This is because some of the uh, viral genomes may be infectious as nucleic acids. In the case of some viruses, we may have to re revert to DNA sequencing and similarity searches to basically confirm that that particular PCR product has originated from the virus. This entire process requires time and this is one of the major bottlenecks in detection and diagnosis of viruses. Additional methods which you can refer to are immuno PCR which relies on a PCR primer linked to an antibody which is highly effective and highly sensitive in detection of specific viruses. Let us now look beyond viruses to genetic engineering of viruses. The genetic elements of viruses such as internal ribosome entry sites, viral promoter binding sites and specific proteins are versatile elements which can be engineered by fusion to other genes for the expression of genes. For example, the internal ribosome entry site can be engineered to by fusion to other genes in order to facilitate transcription and translation of proteins. Viral promoters which are very specific such as the P10 insect promoter, the cytomegalovirus which is a mammalian promoter and the 35S cauliflower mosaic virus promoter are host specific and generally the tools of choice for engineering proteins for expression in these specific hosts. Viral proteases and specific proteins such as flockhouse virus protein have specific functions which can be exploited. For example, viral proteases can be applied to cleave specific proteins and used as diagnostic markers for the detection of viruses. This is a generic design of a viral construct. So we have our promoter binding site which is here in indicated in green and also listed in the text box in case you are visually impaired. We have the ribosome binding site or the IRES which is here. We have the gene of interest, the polyadenylation signal and the terminator sequence. Now when this construct is basically transformed into the host, it will express the gene of interest based on the promoter binding site. Let us look at what we need to do 
if we want to express this gene of interest in human cell lines. In that instance or in that case, I will have to utilize a CMV promoter which is specific to animal cells. However, if I want to express this same gene in a plant, I will have to use a 35S promoter which is a plant specific promoter. This is one of the vectors available from GeneScript which is a very innovative vector. It's called the PDREAM 2.1 vector. It's a 7.2 KB vector. What's unique about this is that it contains three promoters. The CMV promoter is specific to plants, as to animal cells. The T7 promoter is specific to bacterial cells and the PTREN promoter is specific to insect cells. Using this vector as a shuttle, the copy number can be increased in bacteria as it has a specific origin of replication for E. coli. Once a sufficient copy number has been achieved, it can be transformed into animal cells or insect cells in order to achieve the expression of the pertinent protein. Plant vectors such as P. cambia are routinely used to genetically modify plants. They comprise of a 35S promoter which facilitates overexpression of specific genes. In plants, the selection marker is the hygromycin resistance marker and there is an origin of replication which permits multiplication of this particular plasmid in bacterial cells. Okay, these are some of the locations where you can obtain your viral promoters. This is the ad gene site. Most researchers study viruses because they need to engineer vaccines to manage pandemics. There are three types of vaccines which are currently available. The first generation vaccines consist of attenuated virus particles and are as old as inoculation itself. So Edward Jenner, for instance, use attenuated virus particles. Attenuated virus particles do not contain the nucleic acid core. They contain the external or the capsid proteins, which when injected into the host elicit an immune response. Now, obtaining a large amount of virus particles is difficult as well as dangerous as it involves several steps. This has led to the development of second generation vaccines which consists of the viral coat proteins. Viral coat proteins are selected based on their immunological profile. Subsequently, these coat proteins are cloned and expressed in bacterial yeast or mammalian hosts. The viral coat proteins are then tested and applied as second generation vaccines. Most of the vaccines available today are second generation or what are termed as subunit vaccines. The third generation vaccines comprise plasmid DNA based vaccines. These consist of a plasmid DNA construct which contains a promoter binding site specific to the host as well as the antigenic principle. Plasmid DNA vaccines can be developed readily and can be deployed in response to pandemics. So in order to develop plasmid DNA vaccines, we need the genome sequence, we identify potential epitopes and we characterize the potential epitopes prior to development. One of the aspects which needs to be considered very carefully when working with viruses either in diagnostics, vaccine development or gene construction is biosafety and biosecurity. All work with viral genomes or live viruses must be done in a contained facility. The World Health Organization has prescribed specific measures for the containment of viruses and other biological agents in their biosafety manuals.
There are three basic considerations for biosafety and bio risk management. The first comprises risk assessment, the second is risk mitigation, and the third is performance assessment. This is all part of a plan, do, check, and act cycle. Risk assessment begins by asking questions. The first question which we ask is, which risk group does the biological agent belong to? Risk groups can be determined by referencing the WHO database. The second element which we look at is, does the biological agent cause symptoms in healthy human adults? What is the morbidity and mortality rate in human adults based on prior information? What is the route of transmission? Is it an ocular transmission route? Is it subcutaneous? Is it nasal, oral? We need to determine this when we do our risk assessment. What is the infectious dose? Well, how many particles of the biological agent or the virus are required in order to cause an infection? Do we have access to vaccines or other therapeutics which are essential for containment of the virus in case of an outbreak? Does your experimental protocol enhance or attenuate virulence which increases or its degree of virulence or infection? Are the staff suitably trained and what emergency procedures do you have in the event of a breach of containment? These are just some of the questions which you need to address when you do a risk assessment. Once you have conducted your risk assessment, you move on to risk mitigation. Risk mitigation is achieved by application of the following controls. Elimination, which involves curtailment of an experiment because it poses a very high residual risk. Substitution, which may involve changing the biological agent to a less lethal virus or a less lethal biological agent. Third are engineering controls, which involve the use of uh, directional airflows to contain the host within the laboratory. The fourth are the administrative controls, which involve standard operating procedures. And the fifth involve the personal protection equipment, which consists of all the, the things you wear in order to protect yourself from the virus. This may include gloves, uh, biosafety gowns, the air curtains which are used as well as the masks and the eye protection equipment. And finally, when we do our risk assessment cycle, we do our performance assessment in order to determine whether our biosafety protocols are valid and they eliminate risk associated with a specific biological agent. Now this process of bio-risk management is always subjected to continuous quality improvement in order to mitigate risk which may not have been foreseen during the original risk assessment. Those of you who are attending this class can now undertake the following ass assignment. I have provided you with a uh, NCBI gene accession number which is here you can click and link on this link and access it and you will be required to do this following process identification of the epitope identification of the constant region of the epitope designing of the plasmid DNA construct and development or basically design of a procedure for testing and deploying the vaccine candidate. I will discuss this assignment in a future video as I have to focus on the completion of this specific lecture. Thank you very much for watching this video on viral molecular biology. I hope it has been useful to you. You can download this lecture notes and I will be sharing this link on the YouTube channel. Thank you very much and have a good day.